Dennis McDonald, thank you again for joining me. I got a heck of a question from a Dead Sea Scroll scholar yeah. who's also a patron of mine, Matthew Munger. Thank you so much for the question to Dennis. And I can't wait to hear his response to this. Consider joining the Patreon if you haven't already. We could use your help to keep this stuff going. Question, Matthew Munger says, One of my colleagues in Oslo, Carl Olav Sannez, has been one of Dennis's most open critics. I tend to agree with Dennis that there is too much literary similarity between the Gospels and Homer Virgil to ignore. But how does Dennis respond to Sannez's criticism that the parallels to Homer and Virgil are too veiled to be obvious to the reader and thus ineffective as mimesis? Matthew, that is such an important question. And uh, I'm so glad you asked it. So it gives me an opportunity to uh, engage you and maybe uh, Carl Olaf as well. I consider him to be a formidable opponent and I consider him to be a friend. And I admire his scholarship. And in fact, for his most recent book on the Homeric Centos, I wrote an endorsement. And um, so we have, I wouldn't say buried the hatchet, but I think we can sustain a friendship with each other and mutual admiration. Uh, he is a fine trained uh, classicist. His Greek is excellent. And his uh, grasp of what's going on, not just uh, with Homer and Greek literature, but also with patristic literature, is very impressive. And um, he also uh, writes on the New Testament, I'm, I'm sure. But his primary contributions have been as a classicist to understand the reception of, let's say, the Homeric epics and the Homero Centones. And the book that I endorsed was a very interesting theological assessment of how the poets, especially Evdosia, uh, the earliest uh, female uh, Centoist, um, construed the gospel story by using Homeric lines and to uh, changing the narrative. Uh, one of the brilliant pieces is that Judas becomes really a character uh, as uh, the devil. And uh, there are other <laughs> very subtle and uh, important shifts. So I, I um, have great respect for him and uh, would not want to identify my differences from him with uh, a diminishment of my appreciation for him. But I do differ with him. And in order to uh, give a better answer, I'm going to appeal to recent works, um, uh, especially by Robin Faith Walsh, who has argued that the gospel authors are not um, they're actually intellectuals that are engaged with the intellectual project of writing for other intellectuals uh, and not for uh, Christian communities um, th without educated people. And so that the readership of if if Robin is right, and I'm sure that she is and from my perspective, the readership of the Gospels was better educated, more sophisticated than we usually give credit for. The other is that I would insist that Homer was more ubiquitous in the culture than just in what people learned in school. It was sometimes in the theaters. It was in artwork. Um, the culture was saturated with it. So one did not have to so, well, one of the things, uh, Matthew, that Carl does, and it's very helpful, actually, I've used it, is to talk about the use of Homer in schools and um, where it uh, played a role in um, higher uh, uh, Greek society. And that's been very helpful. But I would, uh, from my perspective, the parallels are so strong uh, especially in Mark and Luke and Luke Acts, that the author had to expect some of the readers to appreciate the intellectual playfulness 
and um, alternatives of the Christian story to those among the Greeks that uh, the readership had to include at least enough intellectuals to make that enterprise available. Now, other people um, like Tom Brody and others have said it doesn't matter about the intellectual properties of the audience. It has to do with the intellectual capacities only of the author that the author benefits by writing things for oneself um, that uh, are indebted to the Homeric epics or to tragedy or whatever. I don't buy that. I think that these um, parallels are hermeneutically and theologically fraught. They are carrying some kind of freight. And for that to happen, you have to have somebody receiving the freight on the other end that he has uh, that intellectual capacity. The, um, the objections by Carl Olaf are similar to those of Margaret Mitchell, and they get repeated over and over again. And this is why I so welcome Robin Faith Walsh's reassessment of the um, intellectual register of uh, gospel authors, because I think we've been dumbing down on them far too much. So anyway, that's my read on Carl Olaf. Um, I respect him. He's a wonderful fellow. I think we uh, are um, friendly combatants, uh, but I do think that the authors and recipients of the Gospels uh, had more sophistication than Carl is willing to grant. I have to jump in now, and I haven't done this yet, but this is a question that I have to say. I am not an expert. I, I don't know Greek. I am an ignoramus when it comes to the language. Okay. And I'm reading this. I'm reading the narrative. I don't need to get the Xerox copy of this Greek word. It's the same Greek word, like practically the same Greek words, right? Because sometimes you can find parallels. You might find a similar Greek word somewhere else. The themes, the narratives, the motifs, the pictures, like, it overwhelmingly seems like there's garrison demoniac, right? I'm like blown away at the comparison. I'm blown away, right? Then I start looking at other examples from Jesus's death to his uh, baptism and empowerment to what else? I mean, there's so many of these examples. I don't know why anyone, I don't understand. I don't get it. And to me, I don't know. I just don't get it. What do you think it is? I have two responses to you. One is, if people want to know about Polyphemus, they do not have to read Odyssey 9. Polyphemus is an artwork. You know, it's a, it's a famous story. So you don't have to be uh, educated to read Odyssey 9 in order to understand the, the Polyphemus story. Yeah. I am looking at this not as an expert, yeah. right? But I, there are some things I know. Right. I know that they had to know this literature in order to learn Greek. I know this. I don't need to know Greek to know that they had to know this, which would make me go, whoa, big, big suspect. So I honestly I mean, this is me psychoanalyzing. This is my problem. This is my fault. I tend to psychoanalyze. I wonder what motivations people have for not actually seeing so uh, I can't judge people's I motivations, know. but I'll, I can. I do remember what I was going to say. Please take me back. To where this is why Lucian is so important in his satires. Uh, Lucian satires uh, are full of satires of the Homeric epics more than any other literature. And for the satire to work, he has to expect that his readers know the story of Polyphemus and Circe and the going to the netherworld and uh, Homer's uh, ascendancy um, and so on. So these stories are out there. Now, to be sure, uh, Lucian may be writing for other intelligentsia. But we don't know that the gospel authors weren't writing for intelligentsia. Robinson and so, she, she and, yeah, yeah, and you don't need to have a, a declaration. I'm now going to imitate the Odyssey to know that uh, a monster who lives in caves 
um, is going to be trouble and the hero is going to escape somehow. So, um, but I, that's one reason I really love Lucian. Uh, Lucian satires are just a treasure for understanding popular reception of the Homeric epics. Thank you, Dr. Munger. Appreciate your question. Uh, this is a really good one. I really appreciate it. And uh, consider joining the Patreon. Ladies and gentlemen, be sure to sign up for Dr. Dennis R. McDonald's Greek Mimesis in the New Testament course, reading the Gospels with one eye on Greek poetry. Dennis spends 18 lectures diving into several parallels, building up the methodology to show you his methods and how he sees that the New Testament authors cleverly rewrite and really make Jesus such a better figure than what we see in the older Greek myths and their poetry. You can sign up today, own it for life. There are several hours, well over eight hours of content in this course with 18 lectures. Dennis gives you so much to read and look up and consider in investigating. Did the New Testament authors actually imitate the Greek epics to write their narratives about Jesus? There's several reading recommendations, additional resources. Under every single one of the lectures, you can download 1 through 18 on MP3 in case you want to just download it and have it in your your whatever the device might be in order to work and listen at the same time you don't have to just see it but if you decide to watch the content it is all in 4k extremely high quality content as you can see and you I did it in from you know, greek latin uh, the audio is nice and French loud work. takes you through his book and this takes is- a deep dive Be sure to sign up today. I hope you will. This helps Dennis McDonald and it helps educate the world on what's going on in scholarship.